So with me is Barry Wolf, and he is a psychotherapist, writer, and professor of integrative approaches to psychotherapy. He worked for many years in the National Institute of Mental Health and is an influential member of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. He's always striving to tighten the gap between research and practice, and your work has focused mostly on the treatment of anxiety disorders, but I'm sure we'll be able to cover a lot more than that, so thanks for having us, Barry. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> so you ha you've had quite a ride in terms of theoretical development. You started yes. as humanistic, you went a little bit into behaviorism, and then you trained in Gestalt. What were the major motivators for these efforts along the way to integrate? Okay, uh, when I was finishing up my undergraduate uh, degree, uh, I became very enamored of the scientific method. Yeah. Actually, before I really understood it completely <laughs> and its probabilistic nature, uh, I thought, all right, here's a methodology that can lead us to foundational truths about human beings. Um, ironically, uh, I was very interested in psychoanalysis at the time, but <laughs> I, picked a, I picked a school, the University of Illinois, where I started my graduate work, which was going through, I call it a putsch, uh, where they were getting rid of anybody on the faculty with a psychoanalytic orientation and bringing in uh, Skinnerians, basically mm -hmm. uh, behavior modification types. Mm -hmm. um, and I lasted two years <laughs> under that <laughs> regime before I dropped out. Here's the problem. Uh, I bought into the behaviorist critique of psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. but behaviorism itself, I felt, was a poor... Uh, explanatory alternative, mm -hmm. you know, based on my observations and my own experience. Mm -hmm. So I was left in a great deal of epistemological doubt. Yeah. And actually, uh, it was a major reason for me leaving. I did not want to continue with the indoctrination <laughs> into <laughs> behavior therapy, which is a bit ironic. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> and left, and I went to work uh, at the NIMH, but in what we call the intramural part, where they hire government scientists to do their own research. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, I was uh, trying to decide what I was going to do with my life. I thought <laughs> I was through psychology. Uh, after two years, I then decided I wanted to go back and become a therapist and went to the University of Florida. And, and interestingly, uh, I started uh, really learning how to do therapy in the counseling center at Florida, where we learned, I like to say, to talk psychodynamically, but to practice Rogerian. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I don't know if we want to get into that, but there are lots of reasons for that. I, I know you, you were influenced by reading early on the works of Rogers. Uh, that is correct. Mm -hmm. But then you also have... He was this, actually, yeah. He was a sort of a lifesaver. In what way? Because, well, I could, I felt that both the psychoanalytic meta, meta psychology and the behavioral uh, theory mm -hmm. both diminished, you know, at least my idea of what human beings were like. Mm -hmm. And toward the end of my stay at the University of Illinois, I found. On Becoming a Person, a book by Rod, was, yeah. was very influential. And it was like, ah, a breath <laughs> of fresh air. Yeah. And so I, that really started me, started my interest in more client-centered and later humanistic mm -hmm. approaches. I know you then became quite confident about this approach. What led you then, what disappointments led you to try to integrate other ideas? Right. Uh, it was very interesting <laughs> that what I, I love two things about Roger's approach. Uh, one, I think it really honored human beings in all of their glory. Uh, at the same time, 
by taking a passive uh, listening approach to therapy, um, I felt that, you know, by doing so little, it seemed to me, mm -hmm. that there was less chance of my screwing up a, per a patient's life. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I think Jerry Davison called it impactophobia. <laughs> I have much of an impact mm -hmm. uh, on human beings. Mm -hmm. um, however, this passive listening approach didn't work so well with phobias. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people would come in with a very well-defined symptom. They wanted help to get rid of it. Uh, and I'm reflecting their feelings. Uh -huh. <laughs> there was a mismatch in mm -hmm. some respects. Uh, and I began to wonder, you know, well, maybe the Rogerian approach can't treat everything. Mm -hmm. so, that was the first uh, yeah. scintilla of doubt <laughs> <laughs> entered my mind mm -hmm. that that was a, a comprehensive approach to therapy. So, put another way, maybe you started seeing that the Rogerian conditions were maybe necessary but not sufficient. That's exactly uh, the way to put it, yes. Mm -hmm. They were necessary. They yeah. are necessary, mm -hmm. but they're not sufficient in many instances. So how did the news come in? <laughs> <laughs> well, one way was had to do with my role at the NIMH. The second time I joined them, um, which was after I got my PhD at the University of Florida, I then spent two years in the counseling center at Michigan State, uh, we, I went back to the NIMH and the, in the extramural program. Mm -hmm. And this is a program where uh, people apply for research grants. And they, if they are approved by a peer review process, they will get taxpayer money mm -hmm. <laughs> to do their research. Uh, but, you know, we... we they weren't scientists that were hired directly by the government. Mm -hmm. And in my role, I had to keep up with everything that was going on in the field of psychotherapy. Yeah. And what, so, what was so great about that is as the manualization uh, requirement became to dominate the review of research projects, I would get all these man therapy manuals and I could read them. I had to read them. <laughs> But anything that really struck my mind is something I could add to my own practice, mm -hmm. uh, I found very useful. Mm -hmm. and particularly uh, the behavioral treatments for phobias. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where it began. And I said, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> uh, you know, so I, I, I began to see some value to the behavioral approach. Mm -hmm. and as we moved into the 1980s, there was the uh, and with the introduction of cognitive therapy and cognitive behavioral therapies, um, that began to expand my own thinking about how could we incorporate ideas and strategies from uh, these all other orientations. Okay, so behavior therapy in a way filled a gap that was needed, specifically for yeah. the, maybe the phobia intervention. Yeah. I think I read that you were influenced in this sense by David Barlow and some other people. Mm -hmm. That That's correct. Mm -hmm. Although, Dave and I fought more than we agreed. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but we did together host. Mm -hmm. He has the an outside investigator, me as a program person for the NIMH back in the early, mm -hmm. uh, well, around 1980, mm -hmm. we hosted a workshop on uh, behavior therapy research. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so there I, I got even more, I think, uh, educated yeah. in, in that approach. Okay, so and where does this other experiential gestalt side come in? Right. Well, during the that same period, I be, you know I could never let the humanistic part of me uh, completely uh, fade away. And uh, there was a there's a fellow in in D.C. who was conducting a two year seminar on Gestalt therapy, mm -hmm. and uh, I went became a student again, 
and went through that program and learned a great deal more about a little more active approach to a humanistic therapy mm-hmm. and uh, found a lot of what Rudy had to offer um, to be helpful in, in my own therapy. Okay. Uh, particularly a focusing technique that we'll probably say more about yeah. a little later. Mm-hmm. For sure. If we, if you actually, that's a good segue. We can go into your own work now. We've seen this development over the years. Well, right. In 2005, you wrote a book, Understanding and Treating Anxiety Disorders. And first right. of all, I'd like to ask you, in what ways did you find the existing models of anxiety lacking? Uh, well, what I did was... Uh, I did a, a systematic review of every orientation that had something to say about anxiety and its disorders. Mm-hmm. First, at the theoretical level, mm-hmm. and did an analysis of what I thought was strong about the, ther- the theory yeah. of anxiety, each approach, and what was uh, missing. Yeah, you mean empirically I, strong, like the... the empirically system. strong and also... Uh, experientially strong with respect <laughs> in terms of my own experience. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that sort of makes sense uh, in terms of the work I was doing over time. Mm-hmm. And again, because of the cross fertilization between my private work and what I was doing at the NIMH, I began to home in on anxiety disorders yeah. as a specialty. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I forgot where it was. So the theory was lacking, in a sense? Uh, Yes. There certainly were some real deficiencies in each theory. Mm -hmm. And I I looked at five different uh, theories of anxiety. Uh, I actually did the same uh, review all over again when I look at the psychotherapy uh, practice. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. even though every orientation puts together their theory and their pra- their practice ideas. Mm-hmm. I thought it was important to just separate them uh, for analysis purposes. And let's look at the theory, and let's look at, look at the treatments, and how well do the treatments really derive from their mm-hmm. uh, theory? Uh, so, and that was sort of the foundation of an integrative model that I had been working on. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a number of years by then, mm-hmm. which you can see within that model uh, elements of each of the aforementioned theories. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there is a popular idea uh, among academics, but I think in general, and even in policymakers, that cognitive behavior treatments are more appropriate, more effective for the treatment of anxiety disorders. How, yes. true, how true is this statement? Well, there's a certain amount of truth to that, but I think at some point it, it hits a ceiling. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, explain what I mean. And by the way, even uh, Joseph Wolpe, the founder of uh, behavior therapy, found this himself. <laughs> when you are working with a well described monosymptomatic uh, anxiety disorder, the behavior therapies can be very effective. The problem is the patients uh, that you see in private practice come in with very complex Mm -hmm. collection of anxiety Mm -hmm. symptoms, which are also connected to other areas of their life, you know, the personality characteristics and so on. Uh, So once you uh, begin to explore the derivation of... uh, or origin of these symptoms, mm-hmm. it becomes a great deal more complicated. Yeah. And so I, I would say uh, CBT is typically partially effective mm-hmm. with many anxiety disorders. Uh, I doubt seriously whether they really, uh, the CBT therapies really produce a durable or comprehensively effective therapy for anxiety. 
That's interesting. So there's a, and this connects with a little bit of what we'll talk about about your own model. So there, yes. there is this sense that uh, there's also a lack on the durability and the depth, in a sense, of certain treatments. Yes, exactly. Yeah, which uh, curiously enough has actually been a psychoanalytic critique for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, interesting, I. I sort of uh, suggested the same thing that when I began to really treat anxiety disorders with a behavior therapy, uh, what would come up would be conflictual issues in the person's life yeah. of which they were not aware. Yeah. Yeah. And so that here, using a behavioral approach, I was uncovering unconscious conflict. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and, and maybe this comes in the more awareness processes, uh, consciousness raising that you picked up from the humanistic side, the Gestalt side. Exactly. They helped. And they, they helped very much yeah. because I, what happened was, particularly with the use of imaginal exposure, mm -hmm. Exposure and imagination. Mm -hmm. That when we began to focus in on the images and the thoughts that the people have when they were uh, confronting the feared object, mm -hmm. uh, that's when we got into uh, much deeper territory, mm -hmm. if you will. Actually, but, I'd, I'd but, like to to ask you about sure. that because you've yeah. used imagery techniques extensively and wrote about that. Yes. Uh, yeah. What do you think are the particular benefits of correctly using these imagery techniques? Well, let me just say uh, by way of preference mm -hmm. that although I talk a lot about a specific focusing technique, mm -hmm. and I think that um, since that time, people are doing imagery techniques in a lot of different ways. For example, uh, EMDR. Mm -hmm. I really see as a form of uh, imagistic exposure yeah. therapy. Mm -hmm. you know? so, but for me at the time, what I found uh, is if you can get the individual uh, after uh, being relaxed, um, it's sort of a semi-trance, if you will, um, if they focus on the feared object, it brings up rather quickly mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the underlying or implicit meanings of the anxiety. Yeah. And uh, which then, number one, showed the connection between the surface level behavior and what's going on at a depth level of the individual. Mm -hmm. But it also shows you, uh, points you toward the work that needs to be done in addition yeah. to exposure therapy. So it guides you in a sense. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. Making a bridge between what you're saying now, uh, I know that this imagery work kind of leads you into the concept of self and the importance of self wounds. Yeah. Self wound right. is a concept you, you have presented in your own book. Yes. I'd like right. to, to ask you about something because you have argued that self pathology may represent an integrative treatment focus for the various perspectives in psychotherapy. Can you elaborate? Yeah. Yes, I tried to make that case. And again, during my uh, theoretical analysis of all the approaches to anxiety, I, I, in my mind, I think it was pretty clear that the final common path, the locus rather, mm -hmm. of pathology is the relationship that a person has with their own self. Okay. And, and that... There are some ways of thinking, feeling, or imagining oneself that are so painful, mm -hmm. unbearably painful, mm -hmm. that they have to defend against uh, being aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just give you a, a, a quick case in point. Um, I had a patient once who would not make a doctor's appointment. Why? Because she didn't want to find out that she had a lethal disease. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, this is a, a very clear and common way of seeing how, uh, you know, seeing oneself, not just having the disease, it's seeing oneself 
as now a a a dying individual yeah. is so unbearable yeah. that they develop behavioral, cognitive, and emotional defenses mm -hmm. uh, to avoid knowing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, so I think that's a clear example. Another example, which is a little more subtle, is uh, a patient who was, had OCD, and he was, he just had a he had a two-year-old grandchild, and when that grandchild came to visit. Um, he would spend four or five hours on his hands and knees going around his entire house to make sure there was no object mm -hmm. that his two-year-old grandchild might ingest mistakenly. Mm -hmm. As we did our work, and particularly the focusing work, mm -hmm. what became clear uh, was that doing harm to a loved one mm -hmm. um, was unbearably painful. Yeah. And so he could not see himself as someone who uh, would, you know, even inadvertently harm someone that he loved. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he couldn't even risk it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He couldn't risk it. Mm -hmm. well, one thing I picked up from your work, and it kind of helped me in a sense, is to uh, always ask, whenever a person has a thought or a feeling or a behavior, think, what does this say about me? You yes. It's, so, yeah, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's... like. Like from your work, there's like this sense that you have to redirect what does this anything redirect about the self in a way. That's you know? right. So That's what, right. What is a self wound? You have to describe this. Okay. Uh, the self wound uh, at the experiential level is something that is unbearably painful. Uh, so painful that you can't even see yourself. Uh, you can't even look at yourself as someone who. Uh, maybe in a particular situation like having a lethal disease or, or someone uh, who, again, who's created harm, uh, who might create harm for someone that they love very much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, at a more abstract level, I think of it as a generalized view that one holds consciously or unconsciously, mostly unconsciously, mm -hmm. about the self. And, you know, that for whatever reason they cannot face up to. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that people can come by that sense of self, if you will, either by incorporating, much as Roger suggested years ago, mm -hmm. by incorporating opinions about self mm -hmm. that are not accurate. Mm -hmm. Uh, they just swallowed whole mm -hmm. the negative opinions from loved ones or friends. Mm -hmm. But another way is that they actually are deficient in some ways that are important to their lives, and uh, but they're not ready to face that reality and do something about it. Mm -hmm. So would you that, argue... That makes, it makes all sense to me. Would you argue that yeah. for, for this reason maybe the common factors could be so... Uh, impactful, like acceptance of the self, then yes. reflects in the yeah. outcomes. Right. Yeah. Ah. yeah. Uh, so self acceptance uh, becomes critical. I think we tend to underestimate how hard the work is. Mm -hmm. Self acceptance. Oh, self acceptance. Of self -acceptance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's hard work to face some things about uh, yourself that you've spent years. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, rewarding off that awareness. Yeah, well, but you've described this self-wound uh, concept more in the context of anxiety disorders. I would like yes. to know if you think this concept could be useful in a trans-diagnostic way. I do, uh, very much so. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote more about, you know, I focused more on anxiety because I knew more about it and had, worked, had more experience with it, but uh, in the last decade, I say, I would say, I began to see that this model has applicability uh, more generally speaking, yeah. uh, particularly with mood disorders. Yeah. Uh, I, I think mood disorders present some complications and some difficulties with doing the psychic psychological work mm -hmm. that, at least so far, uh, have not been as successful. 
yeah. treating mood disorders as I was with anxiety. And in personality disorders also? Uh, uh, very definitely, but that's even harder mm -hmm. to bring about change, at least for me. I think <laughs> there, there may be some therapists out there who can... I, I, Do I the suppose it's in general. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I just think um, it, 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 it's very tough work. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, even when you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know it has to happen. It's tough work for the therapist, and it's very hard for the patient. Yeah. To, you know, with personality disorders, uh, for anything to change. Yeah. You have written that depending on the nature of the problem and the characteristics of the client, that you will begin a specific intervention with behavioral, cognitive, or affective realm. Yes. What kind yes. of markers are you on the lookout for this decision? Um, just as, as a general and maybe oversimplified guideline, you can think of people as... Um, be more attracted to action-oriented approaches. Mm -hmm. They come in, they say, yeah, I'm willing to work, I want to fix this. Yeah. And for those folks, I would probably begin with a behavioral or some kind of performance-based therapy. Other people live in their heads, you know, and they like to think things through and uh, so forth. Uh, they may be more amenable from the outset to cognitive mm -hmm. uh, approaches. And then I think there is a minority of folks who really do prefer to work from an emotional point of view. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would begin with a humanistic approach with them. Mm -hmm. But later on, because I, I think each approach does have its limitations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that later on, uh, you would then try and incorporate the other um, approaches that may be less attractive or less known to the individual. Going back to this idea of how you, do, how you, how can you see that? I mean, you have a person yeah. in front of you. Some of them clearly are in what you could call the action phase. If we were to relate yeah. this to the stages of change of Prochaska, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Some yeah. can see that, but tell me, yeah. Let me, just my favorite examples, I once uh, treated a lawyer mm -hmm. who was depressed mm -hmm. and I was so uh, enamored of the imagery work I was doing and uh, very hopeful about it that I began without taking into account that this is a very cognitively oriented lawyer, I began to do the uh, focusing work. Okay. I wanted to get right to the, the feelings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he made a pretense to do the focusing work, interrupted it, and said, uh, listen, you need to know that uh, I am not comfortable with the language of feelings. <laughs> uh -huh. At which point, I, I shifted gears and I became a cognitive therapist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she was much more comfortable with. Okay, so that was a marker. It's, he he yes. directed you, yeah. Yes, Okay. and very often, let's take, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's very trial and that, error, in a sense. It is trial and error, although you can recognize, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of patients, you can recognize, uh, you know, what's going to be the most comfortable approach yeah. uh -huh. uh, to uh begin with. I was thinking now more broadly about your work and the work in SEPI. I know you were part of the organization committee in 1983, yeah, to create yes. a society for the exploration of psychotherapy integration. Since that, it has come a long way, and I'd like to ask you, looking back, what do you think were yeah. the main victories and maybe disappointments of that endeavor? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, you got five guys in a New York apartment, uh, well, four guys and a gal, uh, and we now have 600 people from, you know, 30 countries. It's hard to be disappointed. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think the most uh, gratifying aspect of CEPI is, is its existence, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that we were able to 
bring something to the field that people were really interested in, mm -hmm. uh, that meant something to them. And as I mentioned in one of my papers, uh, the first uh, meeting, which took place at the annual meeting, took place in Annapolis, Maryland, and I was the local uh, organizer of that meeting. After that meeting, which you know, so many people thought was wonderful and eye-opening, mm -hmm. uh, so many people came up to me and said, thank you for doing this for the first time in my career. I feel like I have a home. Yeah. And that was just so gratifying because I think there were so many of us out there yeah. uh, you know, living an underground <laughs> life. You know, Marv Goldfried loves to talk about this. Where I think uh, he won, he went for once went from an, the uh, um, what it used to be the AABT. Uh -huh. It's now ABC. He went from an AABT meeting uh, to uh, Esalon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and so he had one one part of his suitcase packed <laughs> you know, with a tie and suit, and the other uh -huh. side packed with. Uh, more uh, comfortable clothes. Mm -hmm. um, so it was gratifying that a lot of us came out, if you will, mm -hmm. that, look, yeah, psychoanalysis has a good thing to say, but there, it's limited. It, it's, so a, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. Again, it seems something having to do with the self. There was a, self, a sense of identity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, mm -hmm. There were there were so many selves there <laughs> yeah. coming out and saying, okay, I have to accept this is what I really believe. Yeah. yeah. This is what I think. Okay, so that was, of course, a great victory. Yes. And was there any disappointment at all? I connected, for instance, I was thinking about this idea that even after all these years, there really has been no model that been empirically tested as superior above the others. And I think I remember Norcross writing that one of the goals of integration was not just to amalgamate theories in a sense, but actually to right. produce better outcomes. So what's your take on that? Right. Yeah, I, I do have some disappointment. There are a number of us, uh, well, let me start by saying I think a lot of people within CEPI enjoy primarily the fact that it's a forum mm -hmm. where you can come and talk about ideas, uh, you know, and you don't have to be afraid uh, to say anything pretty much at a Sempy meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were many of us. Uh, I remember Bernie Beitman writing years ago, you know, it's time to develop a, an integrative model that works. Mm -hmm. And Norcross yeah. has said the same thing. And I was saying that um, the problem is... It, a lot of people don't even want a unified conception of psychotherapy. To me, psychotherapy integration has always meant a theoretical, a unified theoretical model mm -hmm. from which you could derive, you know, behavioral, cognitive, all kinds of therapies. Yeah. Uh, many people within or outside of SEPI fear that, mm -hmm. fear that it will lead to uh, an ossified rigid uh, orthodoxy uh, and we don't need any more of those. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this actually became an issue for the field when there were a number of us on the steering committee thought it was time uh, to rename the organization. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the Society for the Exploration mm -hmm. of Psychological Integration and uh, some of us proposed and I can't, it might have been me. I said, <laughs> what about changing it without changing the acronym? Let's call it uh, still SEPI, but it would be the Society for the Evolution <laughs> of Psychotherapy Integration, mm -hmm. uh, uh, implying the forward move of the field. Yeah. And we took a vote of the membership. Mm -hmm. And by a small margin, the original name won. Yeah. Because at the argument there was what we really love about SEPI, uh, we're not interested in creating a new orthodoxy or even a new model. They were interested in just being able to talk yeah. freely. Well, it's, it's quite an interesting discussion, I guess, because epistemologically it brings up a lot of questions. Yes. Uh, I can 
understand uh, the the worry that it could create another school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, people worried about that. Well, we're going to end up with. At one time, we were counting, you know, single school therapies. There were yeah. four di four hundred different approaches, mm -hmm. and uh, they were afraid. Well, we're going to have four hundred different uh, integrative approaches. <laughs> and but you, yeah, you have written about this uh, idea of creating a unified theory. Uh, do you yes. think with the current research we have enough to grasp at least an attempt at that? Not really. Okay. Uh, you know, I think some of us, at least starting out, thought we had. <laughs> you know, my goal has always been I want to create a therapy, ther theory of therapy that is unbeholden to any particular mm -hmm. approach. Yeah. The language problem thus far is unsolvable. You can't help but use the language that people are familiar with. Yeah. So you look at my model, you'll see cognitive behavioral, you'll see humanistic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I was at the NIMH, I, I organized a workshop mm -hmm. to try and stimulate research on psychotherapy integration. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we identified as a group the language problem was a major issue. Uh, Yeah, mm -hmm. there is no psychological Esperanto. Mm -hmm. There's no universal language yet. Yeah, and, and, and I think go ahead. I think you're going to need one mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to end up with a unified model. Okay, and besides the language problem, what about the? Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> we just don't uh, know enough yet. Okay. Um, yeah, I spent. <laughs> I spent, I would say, you know, 20 years on my model, and it was focused on anxiety. Yeah. You know, true, I think it has broader implications, but uh, no one is doing research on my model that I'm aware <laughs> of, not in the United States anyway. Uh, so trying to develop a model that takes in the insight of all of these different approaches mm -hmm. and, and produces what Paul Wachtel likes to call a seamless integration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that, that's years away, okay. if ever. <laughs> okay, so there has been this move away in some ways to just focus on the model and focus on the therapist. Uh, we do know that uh, some therapists have hugely better outcomes than others. They have also yeah. some of the super shrinks sometimes have been called. Right, right. right. And you've been training therapists for many years now, so I'd like to ask you what you think are the core qualities and skills of an effective therapist. Uh, well, certainly I think uh, Rogers paved the way with the necessary conditions. Mm -hmm. And of course, some of you know, Rogers, all of this traces back to Freud. Um, but um, in terms of other qualities, um, I, I at this point, I say I think people need to uh, know the literature, know the therapies, incorporate what they can for themselves. I think there's some personality limitations among different therapists for the kinds of therapy that they can do and do well, mm -hmm. and. Uh, So will we get past that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Wow. Um, but certainly they should have a lot of uh, arrows in their quiver, a lot of techniques that they can uh, do. Uh, but as a therapist, uh, you always come back to the basics. <laughs> you know, empathic attunement, being able to listen, uh, being skillful in presenting Uh, another perspective for patients to think about, mm -hmm. uh, in, encouraging them but being patient as they try and do the work mm -hmm. uh, when it's active work they have to do to get to improve. Yeah, so I, uh, I can hear a lot of uh, responsiveness in a sense, flexibility. Yeah. That's a good word. I love uh, Bill Styles for <laughs> introducing Yeah, responsiveness. Okay. Uh, it's critical. There is a, one last question that I have been asking everyone, and I'd like to ask yes. you, which sure. is, 
what advice do you wish you would have received when you were starting out as a psychotherapist? Uh, uh, even though I think I was afraid of the process, you know, again, impactophobia, uh, <laughs> I think in our effort to convince the world that we have simple, efficient methods for therapy, I think one of the uh, drawbacks to that has been to underestimate how hard therapy, uh, the therapy work can be. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I just think, you know, just to share personally, I've always wondered about my own emotional stamina. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I knew what was supposed to happen, <laughs> Uh, and I was very confident that if I could help the patient do the work, uh, the patience that's, that's required, uh, the stamina that's required to deal with patients who would rather, you know, put you down, beat you up, uh, <laughs> than do the work they need. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's the, just how difficult the work can be is a major, um, you know, so. A message you sent to yourself in a way. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like, this is hard work. <laughs> Bear. I don't understand. I, you know, I have colleagues who have 30, 40 clients a week, and I don't understand how they, how they can do that. Uh, my top was, you know, between 15 and 20 uh -huh. after that. Uh, you know, uh, I was done. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just I have to self-accept. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Barry, thank so. you so much for this opportunity. It was great. Okay. Thank you. I enjoyed it. And I hope students or whomever will find it useful. <laughs>